as we make this choice to live our lives with God before God and walk with Him in this year, We've been exploring some interesting themes along that line. Last week, we looked at the story of the pearl of great price and the importance of valuing something. You see, if you don't value something, you aren't going to pay attention to it. It won't functionally mean that much to you. And so you see... This is the story of our lives. We're caught in a constant tension between the challenges of making a living, of being with our families and friends, of organizing our time and space, and so forth, and really making time and putting resource into places where we say we have value, but don't always live it. It's very interesting to think about a budget. Now, I am not an accountant, and budgets are generally really boring. Until, as some of my friends remind me, they are a picture of your priorities. So take a budget. You have a budget of $1,000, and $300 is your car payment. It's a pretty high priority on the automobile because only $200 of your budget is for housing. Interesting priority. Another 200 bucks goes into clothing. You're at $700. It's all about how you're looking, right? Great car. Who cares about the house? Crows. I'm just being silly. These numbers are wildly off, but you get the idea. You have a budget of $1,000. $100 tithe, $100 charitable giving. Now you have 800 left. That's an interesting way of organizing priorities. And this isn't a sermon, by the way, about giving. I'm, I don't want to talk about giving today. What I want to say is that you cannot say you love somebody and never give them the time of day. Wives, do you feel loved by your husbands when he says to you, come with me to this party or dinner party, I really want you there, and then the whole evening he's doting over the other guests and being charming and lovely with them and leaves you to sit with the most quiet, introverted, perhaps boring person at the table. (laughs) And after the whole evening is done, he smiles at you and says, wasn't that a fantastic time? And you're ready to kill him. Not literally, but daggers go forth from your eyes. And he can't understand what the problem is. Wives, do you feel loved in that moment? (laughs) Was close to a rhetorical question because I do indeed know the answer. We only can say we care about somebody or we're listening to somebody or we're prioritizing somebody when we're actually doing it. This is the basis of so many family problems, right? Promises are made that we're going to prioritize a certain thing, and then we don't. And it becomes a dynamic or a problem in the family. Well, that's not the story of the sermon this week either. That was last week's sermon. I'm just recapping because I want us to think about this year of living with God, this this life of living with God, this journey we're on as something that has to be real. It can't just be what you say it is. It has to be what you show it to be. So does it reflect in who you're talking to around the table and whether you give any attention to this woman you say you love or not and whether you introduce her and draw her into the conversation? Might it have anything to do with your budget sheet and where your priorities are? Oh, I love God. God is supreme in my life. But no, I couldn't find a dollar to give to his ministry last year. No, I don't have any money for that. 
Wives, let me ask you this. If you were, if you were not working and making your own money, but were housewives at home and your husband said he loved you and he gave you a zero dollar budget for the year for everything, how loved would you feel? Okay, that's really an antiquated sort of illustration because almost everybody works today and makes their own money. Kids, here we go. Kids, if your parents told you they loved you but gave you nothing all year long, no clothes, no books, no toys, no games, no nothing, just food, water, and a bed to sleep in, if they told you they loved you and Christmas came and there were no presents under the tree ever for any reason... How loved would you feel? Parents, let me ask you this. How loved do you think your children would feel? And yet we have no problem saying, oh, I love God. God is really important in my life. But oh, no, not a part of my budget, not a part of my time. I'm going to use a very strong term. It's functional atheism. Functional atheism. That's what it is. Don't kid yourself. You don't value that which you don't put time, energy, and money into. Unless it's a relic. For many of you, God is a relic. A relic of your distant past. Yes, the angels are sweeping through. God is a relic of your past. Now, I've talked about this many times. I'm not truly a hoarder, despite my descriptions of myself as the same. And yet I chronicle my past and keep boxes of junk that my wife wishes I would get rid of. Hoarder, I am. I'm a terrible hoarder. Would somebody pay for therapy, please? Sponsor me. Um... I can honestly say I give most of those items zero time and very little thought during the year. They certainly don't take any of my budget. So I'm not putting any energy, any time, or any money toward those per se. I am paying for a house for them to be lodged into, but I I think that's a slim argument. Those are just relics of a past that I say I value. And I might but not as anything functional or active in my life. They're a part of, they're a mnemonic for a past. Does that make sense? Is God a relic in your life? Something that's just a nice, tidy thing you keep in a box, a paper, or something that reminds you of something that you just sort of put somewhere and never give any life, time, energy, or resource to? The second thing we want to look at today, or what we want to look at today, is the idea that in order to respond to God in the first place, we can see him as a treasure or value, but we don't even get to really seek him, as I talked about last week, until we understand that we're free to do so. We may do so uh, unknowingly, but I think freedom is at the core of all of this. And so we're going to spend a little time on that today, and maybe you picked that theme up in the reading There are lots of kinds of freedom. One of the freedoms that we need in this life, because there's something about the human situation that just speaks to uh, guilt. Now, I find guilt in society less and less and less. As relativism increases, as pluralism increases, as we become more and more aware of the contextual nature of our observations as truth vanishes as some sort of distant point of objectivity, fewer and fewer people talk about sin and guilt. And yet we all know what it's like to have a boundary crossed or to feel violated. We all know what it's like when we feel jacked, so to speak. Okay. We all know what it's like to be hurt. We all know what it's like to be the one hurt and the one hurting the one telling the truth and the one telling the lie. And so whatever modern sensibilities you may have come to about sin and guilt, I think they're still useful terms. And freedom from that is one of the things we seek. The human seeks some sort of purging, 
cleansing, newness, new start. And when we looked at the new year concept, we noted that just because the solar system has behaved in a certain way doesn't make us different people. A new year doesn't make us a new, new person. But we like to mark it as an opportunity to seek a better version of ourselves. And the better version of ourselves might be less entangled in what we call sin or what we call guilt. And so our psalmist is very relevant here, the poet of the day again. Now I want you to listen to a couple of themes here because they come out really strong. In verses two, 1, 2, and 3, five times sin is mentioned. Blot out my transgressions. That's an old-fashioned word, transgress, means to sin. Blot them out, wipe them out, erase them, make them clean. Purge my record. Wash away all my iniquity, different metaphor. Now we're talking about bathing, a cleansing, okay? Iniquity is sin too, just another word. What a great poet, right? Transgression, iniquity, and here we go. Cleanse me from sin. Parallelism right there in the Hebrew poetry. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Very few of us are unintentional sinners. In fact, all of us have deliberately crossed over the line. So when we look at the whole piece, verse 1 starts with have mercy, and verse 12 ends with restore me. Have mercy, God, and restore me. Restore me to what? The joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit rather than a weak spirit. Take me from the land of Sheol, the pit, the dead, where I reside in sin and pull me back into life with a willing and able spirit to sustain me. Let's listen to the poem. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me, do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. This is not the psalm of a person, the song of a person, who wants to be alienated from God forever. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Now, there are two levels at which the psalmist is seeking salvation. The level of being, moving from death to life, moving from an equipped spirit to a, uh, uh, from an, in, uh, excuse me, moving from a spirit that is, is dead to a willing spirit. You know, David talks about this Take this heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. Allow me to be responsive to you, Lord. And the other level in which he's talking about this is God's presence and a sense of unity with the one who made us. There's a continuity of being between God and us. Is that craziness to say it that way? God has been and will be forever, but out of his being, our being is that was Diane Muff's story today, right? Now, when I talk about a continuity of being, I'm not talking about the same continuity of being that goes with me from birth to death and my sense of self through all that time. Because if I had a, a, a continuity of God's being, I would be eternal in myself even though I'm mortal. But I'm talking about the life of God being continuous and granting human life and the need for that connection not only to live, but to thrive. So the psalmist is pulling us into salvation two different ways. And that's worth paying attention to, perhaps, as we think about the theme of freedom. Freedom from guilt, freedom from sin, freedom from the death that comes. I'm going to go to the New Testament reading in Romans. We're talking about a slightly different thing here, too, but related, and you'll see the continuity and, and the difference. 
famous passage in Romans 8. You know it incredibly well. Therefore, it's the conclusion of an argument Paul has been building and building and building through Romans. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the trick. Without release from sin and guilt, we cannot be in Christ Jesus. And to be in Christ Jesus, as we've noted before, involves participation not only in the life of Christ, but the death of Christ and ultimately the resurrection of Christ. So the path to true freedom is not an easy one. Freedom is found in Christ, but it means participating in his life, his death, his resurrection, and ultimately his glory. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Wow. When I read Paul, sometimes I'm troubled by the complexity of his arguments. He has a way with words, and he spins them around sometimes that spin me around. You ever have that experience reading Paul? Hey, wait a minute, what did he just say? Let's take a stab. What I think he's saying here is that Christ meets the requirement of the law as it comes to us. We've failed the law, and he hasn't. He fulfills it for us, and in himself sets us free to live a different kind of law. Not the law according to flesh, but the law according to spirit. It's a different way of seeing it. We live now a different way. Freedom is no longer found in the indulgence of flesh, which was an interesting issue in Paul's day as it is in ours. I want to comment on this for just a couple minutes. Do we deny ourselves anything? We live in a culture that denies itself nothing. We live in a culture in which there is no boundary to the amount of stuff that we think we're entitled to collect. We buy stuff until there's no room in our houses, and then we either sell it at a garage sale for a fraction of the price we bought it for, we give it away or we put it in a landfill, and then we go and buy more stuff. Am I telling the truth or not? Some of you are saying, no, I don't do that. Good. Cool. Talk to everyone else later. Explain your path to righteousness in that. But most of us are stuck in this rut of just buying junk, filling our houses with it, purging, starting over. Oh, and we, you know, we build an identity around that. No? Yeah, we do. How many, how many sets of golf clubs, men, do you need? Two, three, guns, 10, 20, 50? Women, is 200 pairs of shoes enough? 250? 36 purses? Three? 36 if they're less than 300 bucks a piece, but only three if they're more than 3,000 a piece? I'm not picking on anybody. I'm talking to our culture. We live in a consumerist culture in which we define ourselves in this particular way and deny ourselves nothing. We deny ourselves nothing in the way of indulgences. Our society has no boundaries in food, no boundaries in agriculture, no boundaries in business, no boundaries in sexuality, no boundaries in any aspect of human life. 
There's no condemnation virtually for anything. And if there is, you're somehow a very small or, uh, how shall we say it, um, judgmental person for not being able to accept the person who indulges every fantasy and leaves nothing unturned. You see, this is not life according to the Spirit, and this is not the freedom that God purchased for us in Christ. The freedom Christ came to purchase for us wasn't the freedom to indulge every fantasy of life, materialism, and flesh. The freedom Christ came to purchase for us was that we might be freed from the constraints that we had been under and live by His Spirit, seeking deeper values of joy and peace and love and gentleness and goodness and kindness, mercy and grace, these things in which there can be no fault found in us for. But we're so American, aren't we? I hate to say it, but this is one of the things you're going to have to go home and study about what it is you say you value. Are you really a Christian first? I know a lot of people say, I'm a Christian, then a Seventh-day Adventist, and then I, you know, they kind of try to order things. All right? Figure it out. Go home and try to try to analyze for yourself. Are you Republican first, or a Democrat first, or an American first? Are you an American and then a Republican or Democrat or Green or Libertarian or Independent? Are you a Christian first and then an American? What does that mean culturally? What does it look like in terms of your values? Are you just a citizen of the world first, then an American, then a Christian? Let me know. It's like a budget. This order that you put it in, once you make it, your budget should reflect those values. Your time should reflect those values. Your actions should reflect those values. Am I getting through or am I just speaking Greek up here? Okay. For those led by the Spirit are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Paul is saying that we're led into an intimacy with God that is born of blood. We're adopted into sonship. And I've talked about this before. Some of you new may not remember. In Roman times, an adopted son is even superior to a natural-born son. Let me explain why. An adopted son can never be sold into slavery. A natural son can. This is why Paul uses this term. He doesn't say sonship because that's a good status, but from sonship we can be turned into slaves again. What God does for us is he takes us from a state of slavery, that is slavery to sin, to death, to our own machinations, and he takes us from a life in which we're condemned in the flesh to a life of living in him in the spirit. He helps us reorder things and reprioritize things, and he declares us different. We're no longer slaves, which have no place, by the way, ultimately in the master's house. They serve there. They don't live there. They work there. They have no rights there. Are you familiar with the period of slavery? Have you studied that much in history? I've done some, not a lot. If you've read my letter today, you know that this is the anniversary of the passing of the 13th Amendment in the House, which paved the way for all states to ratify the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States. It's been a long journey since 1865, this 105th. 150th anniversary, for a people freed of slavery to become truly free. Been a long journey. 
we don't like to think about that period very much. We don't like to admit that we're still suffering and living in the consequences of that period of time, in many ways. But we do celebrate emancipation. And the thing is, the difference between a slave and a citizen is huge. <clears throat> if you've studied that period of history, you know that slaves could be treated with almost impunity. Anything could be done to them. They could be made to work incredibly long hours. They could be given incredibly poor conditions to live in. Families could be sold off and separated one from the other. Rape was not a crime. Anything could be done to a slave. A slave was just property. A slave had no rights in the state. A slave had no appeal to the law. But a citizen does. The proclamation of emancipation changed things in the United States, and this is God's proclamation of emancipation. We move from slavery, not just to sonship, but we're adopted as sons and can never, ever again be sold into slavery. That should mean something to us. That should change the way we live. And it's not a relationship that's forced. By him we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. It's an intimate relationship. There are different things that we might think of when we seek freedom. Old Testament reading is a wonderful one. I'm running out of time, so I'll spend just a few minutes on this, but I think it's worth turning to again in your pew Bible in 686, Isaiah 58. Sometimes we seek freedom in the rubrics of religion. We think if we practice our religion a certain way, we're going to be good people, but it doesn't necessarily work that way. A deeper freedom isn't just a freedom of conformity to a set of ideals or doctrines. A deeper freedom is found in acting upon them. And there's beautiful sarcasm in this passage and a wonderful rhetorical question. The Lord is the one speaking through the prophet Isaiah. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Boy, we don't even do that, right? Is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Dripping with sarcasm. And then he asks a rhetorical question. Is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen? You are to loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, set the oppressed free, and break every yoke. Four phrases on freedom. Our task is not just to be free in God and Christ, but it's to be setting people free. You've been freed indeed, now go free somebody else through the power of God. That's what this means. Is it not to share your food with the hungry, provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Who is Jesus quoting in Matthew 24? Is it 25? I get them confused. 25. In Matthew 25, when he's separating the sheep and the goats, and he says, I was naked and you clothed me, and the disciples say, when did we see you naked? Isaiah. Jesus is quoting Isaiah. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly occur. Healing, that's freedom. Your righteousness will go before you. Freedom. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. That's protection and freedom. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, 
and he will say, here am I. (coughs) Sounds good to me. More difficult to do than to say. Finally, there's a freedom that comes in knowing the truth. That's what we try to get at here on Sabbath mornings, some sense of the truth. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Different kind of freedom from slavery and sin, guilt, They answered, we are Abraham's descendants and we've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? Isn't that an interesting response? It's not true historically, it's not true factually, and it's not true spiritually. Did they think Jesus was stupid? Did they think he had not read the Torah? That he had not read Exodus? That he didn't know the history of Jacob and his sons in Egypt and Joseph and 400 years that went by? Of course he did. And Jesus doesn't correct them historically or factually. He corrects them spiritually. Listen. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son of God, capital S, sets you free, you'll be free indeed. I don't know of any way to live a life with God without living it in freedom. And I'm not talking about the freedom that allows you to do anything you want to do whenever you want to do it. That is the wide path that leads to destruction. I'm going to repeat that. That is the wide path that leads to death and destruction. We live in a culture that is a wide path culture. It doesn't matter what you choose. It doesn't matter what you, you can do whatever you want. It's your truth. It's your wisdom. It's your life. It's your perspective. What does the scripture teach us? It is not your life. You were bought with a price. You belong to somebody who made you, who redeemed you, who loves you, who wants to call you not slave, but son or daughter, not servant, but friend. There's no way to live in this No way at all without freedom. Please think about your lives in light of that this week and choose that as you think about living your life with God. Not as a relic, not as a functional atheist, not as somebody who says one thing and does another, but as somebody who has decided to take this journey and live this life in Christ.